The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has uh, earlier warned political parties and candidates against the use of masquerades, public facilities and religious centres for campaigns. Also, Governor Ifanyo Koa of Delta State, the running mate of the People's Democratic Party presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar, has berated the Labour Party flag bearer, Mr Peter Obi, over his outings to churches. He lamented that out of desperation, some presidential candidates are currently reaching out to anything, even at the detriment of their fate, just to win the February 2023 general elections. Joining us to discuss this is Eze Ugo Namdi. He is the co-founder of Excellent Africa. And Choma Izenwafo is a journalist at West Nigeria Info Port Harcourt. Thank you so much, gentlemen and lady, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, for Thank you very me. much. Great. I'll start with the lady. Now, Choma, you're a journalist. Obviously, when INEC came out with this um, um, specification as to how campaigns should be done, um, I'm sure that you obviously have had conversations where people talk about why religion and, of course, um, politics should not mix. But is there really uh, a thin line between religion and politics? Because some people would argue that there isn't. I would always agree with that, uh, that point that um, there isn't a still in Nigeria where we are really a religious nation. A good population is Islamic and the rest is Christ, uh, Christians, and then minority of traditionalists. And we've been, we've been unable to, over the years, uh, differentiate between what we see uh, happen outside. I mean, uh, the, uh, the religion is a product of society. And our society is highly political. And so it's difficult to differentiate the two. And I think this is really the first time that INEC has come to say that, um, that they should not take their campaigns to churches. This is the first time. And a lot of things have actually uh, informed that. And, and um, some people will tell you that because obviously it, um, it doesn't allow for a free conversation, all right? When you think of religion and where the reality of life is, it doesn't allow for a free conversation, okay? So, but then again, the politicians find it quite difficult because the, the, the crowd they meet in churches are different from the crowd they meet when they go for their grassroots campaigns and, you know, when they try to interact. With people. So the church remains one, uh, you know, gathering that allows them to meet you know, a group and a crowd they don't meet when they really do their legwork. Mm. So I, I look forward to September 28th, really, when campaigning starts and see how they, they are going to work around that. I look forward to seeing it. Now, talking about, to you, Izzy, is um, a lot of young people, there's a movement on social media. The movement now, we're seeing a lot of walks in honor of this person and that party. Uh, you know, it's more like a game of numbers now. Let's see who can pull the most crowd to go for a health walk or whatever work, uh, you know, in honor of a political party. But then we're also seeing that these political candidates are going to churches. And when they come into these churches, we see, you know, the reactions of the people that are in those churches, and some of them are going to other places of worship um, just to fellowship with those people. Uh, is that something that we can really frown at, or, or should we leave the church where it is, or the places of worship where they are, and of course allow these campaigns to happen elsewhere? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Uh, actually, we have to frown uh, against this because uh, faith is personal. Uh, what I mean is uh, uh, it's between a man, it's an interaction between a man and his God. Uh, but when it's organized faith, then we're talking about religion. And uh, religion uh, as a part of our society is something that uh, has politics imbibed in it. So uh, what, what INEC is saying and what people are saying is so that we do not pay the, the hefty price is that uh, we have to separate politics and religion. The place of worship is a place of worship and uh, 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 religion uh, uh, is, is something that uh, you, 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 you deal with uh, the, 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 the deepest part, the feelings, the, 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 the psychology of the people. So 
a campaigning in a place of worship, actually, it's unethical. And uh, we've seen instances like in Kano, where uh, the former governor was unseated, even though he was performing very well uh, because of religious sentiment. Mm. And uh, the people of Kano paid for that for at, as long as eight years. You know, so they had to even go back and beg that individual uh, to come back and, uh, you know, continue ruining them in and the, the, beating them in the, in, the, in, the, in the path development. So I think moving on towards 2023, uh, Nigerians should be very careful, uh, critical with the right questions. Uh, we should avoid state capture, actually. Let's talk about um, clarity on, on this. Um, back to you, Choma. Now, uh, I, I'd like to go to, to I would like to reference um, the, the director of programs for Yaga Africa, Mrs. Uh, Cynthia Mbambalu. Uh, she talked about, you know, issue based campaigns and not the use, you know, the usual abuse and personal attacks, um, being that she's saying that, look, elections is a process through which we choose our leaders, people who can take charge of driving this democracy and sustainable de development. And this is the period for us to identify who these leaders are. Uh, but the only way to do that is by listening to the candidates. So if, if a candidate comes to my church and decides to, my pastor decides to give him the microphone, is that a crime? Even though Einek is saying that, you know, they are subject to imprisonment of about 12 months. But then hmm. the pulpit, well, yeah. Chama, just hold on. The pulpit is also a place of admonish, um, admonishing people, educating and informing them. Um, so if a preacher also takes on that role of trying to, um, let's say, campaign of sorts or try to make people pander to a certain person, should that preacher also be, um, you know, subject to this, um, let's say, 12 months imprisonment? Yeah, I think uh, clearly that it, it, it involves everyone. Everyone, is part, we are all part of the electoral process. And we are all subject to this same law. This does the amended electoral act. And uh, I understand is that this uh, electoral act um, section 92, subsection 3 and 4, stated clearly that we should stay away from worship centers. And so whether you are the cleric or you're the politician, I, I believe that when we allow the electoral act to be you know, implemented to the very letter, it's going to actually ensure that we'll see the free and fair election that we are all dreaming about, okay? Yeah. And, um, and so, yes, I, I believe that the clerics understand what's at stake and uh, going all out to tell people. And that's also what's been happening actually shows that a lot of us have not gone to study the electoral act. Okay, civil society like uh, the, the likes of the one that Cynthia and Bamala belongs to continue to say this, that a lot of people, even the political parties and the candidates, do not know what, what's in the new electoral act. And mm. so it's very important that we go acquaint ourselves with it so that we do not shoot ourselves on the foot. And so if they're saying worship centers, public offices and police stations do not campaign in these places, I think, yes, we should pay really close attention and avoid campaigning when it begins on September 28th. Izuko, you're a young person, and I'm sure that you're also trying to, or you work with young people, and, and one of the things that you would be interested in doing is to try to get, get more young people to be interested in the political space, and not just because they want to run for office, but to also understand their rights and responsibility. So let's talk about young people. Um, Choma just made a very interesting point. There are people who do not even know what is in the Electoral Act, let alone understanding, you know, what it's saying about certain issues, um, you know, around this electoral processes. Why do you think that young people are more sentimental towards, you know, who they want to vote or the electoral process in itself, as opposed to understanding, um, you know, the nitty gritty of, you know, our electoral process? Uh, you know, this is where we talk about uh, education. And uh, currently, in Nigeria, there's an existential issue when we talk about education. And uh, sometimes also we want to be very, very careful about our followership, uh, the, the, the momentum that is going on right now. There are several movements. Uh, people are being moved by sentiments of tribe, religion, ethnicity, 
But all this diversity is actually are supposed to play a key role in how we build our nation. We can harness them properly into uh, something that would be very colorful and even attract a lot of things to the country. But uh, it's not happening uh, because there's a lot of uh, uh, push towards state capture. I am still repeating this uh, because I understand what is happening right now. And uh, people are not critically thinking, looking at three C's, which include the capacity, the competence, and the character of the individual who they are following. So, mm. But uh, I, I think young people have an opportunity right now, and uh, they have to be strategic because uh, the decision which they make will actually affect them. We've seen that in 2015. Uh, but I'm happy also because there's a vibrant uh, citizen enga engagement that is happening uh, in the country right now. So uh, we, in moving forward, actually, uh, we have to be more strategic, more ideological, uh, look at all of the platforms and the candidates and look at what ideology stands out. Uh, education is a priority. The kind of education we get, uh, how our value systems also are, uh, are imbibed in these ideologies, these are also very critical. So I, I, you know already I'm a conqueror here, so uh, it's not like I want to promote my platform or well, again, or this is not a, this is not a forum to campaign for anybody. So who you exactly, you want to vote for? Exactly. It's your personal so, business. We're so, not. That's so I'm not allowed. Gonna, I'm, here. I'm yeah, I'm, 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 I'm personalizing it because what you're talking about is on young people, and I know what is happening within our own, um, our own group. So I think uh, in moving forward, a lot has to happen with regards to uh, our critical analysis and thinking and choosing the right leadership. Great. Back to you, Choma. Choma, again, as a journalist, I'm putting you on the spot here. When we talk about um, issue-based campaigns, pointing people in the right direction. And of course, because we are curators of better culture, conversations, whatever it is, the media always gets the blame of, you know, um, one way or the other being complicit in how these narratives are pushed. Even if these politicians are saying certain things, where they say that we're supposed to be the ones who curate how the public digests this information. How well do you think the media uh, is doing in terms of curating conversations, pushing the narratives, as opposed to, um, you know, emotions and sentiments, especially with the screaming headlines that we have today? Really, Marianne, a lot has changed. And we, we, do not, we no longer have the agenda-setting theory for the media. I mean, the people set the agenda now, and then we just observe, and then we watch, and then we, we, what the, we document, we archive what's going on, really, when you look at the media. Currently, we, we, we barely have any media house setting any narrative, no matter how domi, domi, uh, what they call it, dominant uh, that organization is, that media organization is. So I'm saying this to say that the media currently, uh, one role they come to play is to continue to, uh, should I say, because uh, social media is unregulated, is, there, there are no restrictions. And a lot of uh, a lot of the people talking about what we're talking about right now are really doing about about going about it on social media. They're not going about it on the mainstream media. I mean, they, they do. I've, I've been on Twitter Spaces that were on for 24 hours, and they were having conversations of this nature. We cannot have such conversations on on on, on any mainstream media, can you? We cannot talk for 24 hours, even if we want to. Mm. So that shows you that the agenda setting function of the media is kind of shaky right now and and what, and what do you, what do you think is responsible for that let me use the word brain drain here loosely or that um mm -hmm. foot dragging uh per se mm -hmm. what, what do you think is responsible for it why are we seemingly taking the back seat in, instead of you know being the ones who are pushing mm -hmm. the narrative or setting the tone for conversations so, so, like social this? media yeah and social media the internet it's it evolved every other thing it evolves every aspect of life and media isn't left out, okay? So when you say issue-based campaign, I would say that the media, yes, we still have a role to play, but agenda setting seems not to be a part of it anymore. Issue-based campaign, purely because we are able, we are, like you said, we are, we are uh, uh, custodians, of, custodians of history uh, and, uh, and uh, we are 
his, uh, what do you call it? We write down, we write history, okay? And we document these things. And so what we can provide is in-depth knowledge or in-depth information of conversations that are going on out there, going on on social media especially. And for me, that's one thing I would say media houses should begin to dust their old records and their old you know, documents and begin to push out conversations that have been ha had before now and just to enrich the conversation that's already going on. But agenda setting, any media house that wants to set an agenda may just be overwhelmed and, and may be pushing it really too far. Because currently, as I'm talking right now, over 10 Twitter spaces are on and none of them are, are being aired by the mainstream media. They are, they are being driven by individual CSOs and political parties themselves. So agenda setting function is taking the back seat, but the media remains at the forefront of driving the issue-based conversation. And one of the things we would be expecting from them, especially journalists, is for them to be getting to the heart of that conversation. So what are the issues? We are saying that we do not want our doctors leaving the country anymore. We need journalists to get down to the embassies and get down and let's have documents of the exact number of people leaving so that we do not have... Uh, because at the end of the day, when people want to have conversations, they are still going to Google. And when they Google, I want to get the right information. The mainstream media platforms out there, their website, still is what these people having conversations on social media rely on to feed the right information and share and continue their conversation. So the agenda setting may be taking the back for the media, but they still have a big role to play, and that is to get the facts right, put out the facts as, as, as I mean, fact check every conversation that is being had, and that's one role they're going to play when the campaigns begin, and we really want them to be issued there. But I must say, so that's really a tough one because I've, uh, I've followed the politics in Nigeria for some uh, for a while now, and I will tell you that we are so used to toxic publicity. I'm sorry, toxic politics. I mean, the policy is so toxic, and it's almost difficult. I mean, currently, political parties are going to the grassroots, and they say they are doing PVC drives. When you listen to what they say <laughs> during these, uh, you know, voters' card sensitization campaigns. You know that we're obviously going to have a very toxic campaign going on when it begins. And that's really sad. Okay. Well, we're out of time. In, in, in a minute, quickly, is a, um, so we see this special cult following. Uh, we see these hashtags, whether it be the um, um, obedience or articulated or whatever you want to call them, the conquestias. We see these movements. But how will these young people who are following these movements, how will you be able to check these aspirants, check these political parties to make sure that they are going in the right direction? Because it's not just the political parties that should be, you know, directing. We see people fighting. We see people insulting one another. We see some negativity. We've seen some celebrities also call out these movements to say, you're going about it the wrong way. How can these be changed and checked going forward? Because campaign season is upon us. Yeah, actually, you know, our issues are collective. What I mean is that uh, at the end of the day, irrespective of the divide, be it political or ethnic or otherwise cultural, uh, we have an issue whereby we all uh, uh, bear the brunt together, you know. Even the people who have the money now, they cannot even enjoy in the country. I mean, have pleasure or even have some kind of leisure. So what I'm, what I'm saying in moving forward is the young people need to come together. They need to form a collective. Uh, we've initiated an idea where we, where we say converge for new Nigeria. This idea is in, in such a way whereby we want to bring people irrespective of who you support, irrespective as long as you're a youth, you're a young person. We want everyone to come together. We'll have a singular platform. We'll share our ideas together. We can invite these people to these platforms at several uh, 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 at independent locations whereby they can come and then they'll be asked critical questions. Okay. It's going to be a one on one interaction. So I think coming together and chatting a way forward as young people, uh, it gives us, Igbo people say, Igwe PK. So let's, let's do this, you know, irrespective okay. of the divide. Let's pick okay. one person. Let's support this person, and we at the end go. of the day, we, we, we can be happy. All right, I, I want to say thank you. Um, Izugo Namdi is the co-founder of Excellent Africa, and Choma Zengwafo is a journalist. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen and lady, for being part of the conversation.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all for staying with us on the program tonight. We'll take a quick break, but before I go, I'll give you my take. The value of a vote during an election cycle should never be underestimated. Politicians will move mountains to get enough votes. We know this. And when it comes to presidential elections, the amount of money and personal committed to getting our vote should both flatter us and worry us about what these politicians would do, uh, you know, should they get our votes. And now it's, it's a numbers game. We all know this. And the candidates always pitch their tent where the numbers to be won are the highest. So we should not come to you and I as a surprise when states like Lagos or Kanu get descended upon in months leading to the election day. The candidates become more attentive to us and become more caring towards our needs. Such attention is all well and good, but never forget it only lasts for as long as they need your vote. So pay attention and be wary of strangers bearing gifts because you'll be paying for it in the next four years. I am Mary Anacon, thanking you for watching. Have a good evening.